Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, just a quick uh, housekeeping item. If you have any uh, questions, uh, questions, please pop it into the Q&A box on Zoom. Um, but we'll definitely make time at the end uh, to take questions from the audience for our panelists. For those who do not know me, I'm Annabelle Fu. I'm a psychiatrist. I primarily practice outpatient, um, including strong ties. And here with me are several of my colleagues, John Handel, uh, Nicole Doberton, and Heather Muxworthy. Uh, each of them will introduce themselves as we go along in the presentation. Um, and uh, we are definitely excited to be here today, representing our Strong Ties MAP team. And we'll be taking you on, on our journey to integrating mental health and substance use disorder treatment. Okay, there's us. Learning objectives. Uh, we'll start off with talking um, about uh, sort of the history of why we want to integrate substance use and uh, disorder treatment into mental health settings. Um, and just to know, sometimes I'll interchangeably use substance use disorders and addictions. Uh, then we'll transition to talking about the development of our uh, Strong Ties MAP team and the different roles that we play. Um, and then the acronym in terms I'll definitely uh, define in a little bit. And then at the end, we'll um, to finish up with talking about some of the uh, positives and challenges uh, that we have encountered through patient cases. We have no financial relationships of any sort. Here's CME credits. And there's our title. Oh, here's more learning objectives. Because we all love to learn. All right, so I know there's a, a bunch of new faces, so I thought I'd start off by kind of explaining what is Strong Ties. Um, so our Strong Ties Support Clinic is a team-based outpatient mental health service that really are targeting um, serving the adults who str struggle with severe and persistent mental illness. So this includes, but not limited to, anxiety disorders, depression disorders, bipolar schizophrenia, and other treatment-resistant complex mood disorders. And really the idea is that these folks really need um, a sort of a team and community approach to, to treatment. Um, we are located uh, on the same campus as a Strong Recovery, which is, is our addiction yes. services, along with other services, including uh, adult partial hospitalization program, outpatient medicine psychiatry, um, care management, and other crisis services. Um, our neighbors include Movies 10 and Jay's Diner. So if you're in, ever in the area, you want to drop by for lunch and a movie, feel free to come by and say hi. I promise I won't ask why you're watching a movie in the middle of a workday. Okay, now although Strong Ties has been around since the 1980s, only in the past few years have we begun to really integrate substance use disorder treatment into our mental health service, and we are not alone in this. So this chart comes from a 2020 uh, National Survey on Drug Use and Health that was uh, administered by SAMHSA, and it really kind of summarizes the key findings um, in terms of uh, the mental health, mental illnesses, and substance use disorders. So uh, the light blue represents those with serious mental illness, and serious mental illness defined as uh, folks who have some sort of mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder that meets DSM criteria and is impairing to their functioning. And as you can see, uh, the large percentage of them um, are using different, several different drugs of some sort. Um, and now we call it uh, folks who struggle with both mental health illness disorders and uh, substance use disorders as co-occurring co disorders. Um, sometimes you'll hear the term dual diagnosis being used. And co-occurring disorders are uh, strongly associated with socioeconomic and health factors uh, that can challenge recovery, such as homelessness, um, unemployment, uh, incarceration, criminal justice involvement, and suicide. Now in 2020, up to 5.7 million adults with co-occurring disorders, uh, about a third of them did not re receive any treatment at all. Um, and uh, uh, folks who did receive the treatment, the majority of them received only mental health treatment and not substance use disorder treatment despite having both disorders. And less than percent actually received treatment for both disorders. So this is a problem. Now, when we talk about um, addiction treatment or this substance use disorder treatment, we're not just talking about behavioral therapies, but also something called MAT, medication-assisted treatment. 
Um, MAT traditionally refers to medications that are used to treat opioid use disorder, but we can extend that to also treat other disorders, including alcohol use disorder. Uh, I'm not going to go into the pharmacology of these medications, but I do want to give a quick overview of the, uh, the big three that are used to treat opioid use disorder. Um, methadone is a long-acting opioid uh, that is highly regulated and um, in the treatment for op op opioid use disorder. So we are unable to offer this as strong ties, but our uh, colleagues at Strong Recovery Next Door does um, offer that. Now, Trexone is an opioid antagonist, so that blocks opioids, um, and it comes as oral form and all, also uh, as an extended injection form, also known as Vivitrol. And this can be used for both opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder. Uh, last but not least is buprenorphine, which is a partial opioid agonist, so also an uh, opioid. Um, some of the names, formulations you'll hear about is called like Suboxone, which is an oral form of it, or Sublocate, which is an ejection form of it. Um, now, these medications can be used for medically supervised withdrawal, like detoxifications, uh, maintenance treatment, or prevention of relapse or reoccurrence. Now, MET has been shown to reduce illicit opioid use, uh, improve retention and treatment, lowers the risk of relapse and reoccurrence, improve functioning and quality of life. However, in 2020, among the 2.5 million people who uh, had an opioid use disorder diagnosis, about 11% of them uh, actually received MET for opioid use disorder. Also a problem. So traditionally, treatment for people with cold coronary disorders has taken place in parallel or sequential settings. Um, sequential meaning um, you're treating one disorder at a time. Um, and once you kind of complete that treatment, you refer them to the uh, other service to uh, complete the treatment for the other disorder, which I kind of call the hot potato effect where you're passing folks from one way to another. Uh, parallel settings refer to treatment models that um, probably um, it's more relevant to us, where you have uh, mental health services being treated in one place, and then you have a uh, substance use disorder treatment uh, being occur occurring at a different facility, which uh, may be in a different campus or a different uh, system. Now, quick show of hands. How many of you uh, in the audience who uh, work with mental health, uh, who provide mental health treatment, have referred or recommended somebody to substance use disorder treatment, and they just never connect for any reason? Raise your hand. All right. Yes, definitely in the audience. Anyone want to share, comfortable sharing maybe one or two reasons why in those situations that connection didn't happen? And I'll read the answers to the audience. Yes, go ahead. Yep, folks, uh, people who are not ready. So um, different stages of change, pre-contemplative. Anyone else? But we'll definitely um, talk a little bit about the barriers to it. Oh, sorry, yes. Right, uh, definitely um, barriers in terms of maybe transportation or convenience or other reasons. Uh, so the answer, the answer was uh, not wanting to go to two different places for treatment. Now, systematic reviews uh, suggest that those who receive integrated treatment for mental health and substance use services really show clinical improvement and treatment satisfaction. But researching this is pretty hard. Um, you know, researching effective management of uh, and care for people with colon recurring disorders has a lot of methodological challenges. Um, you know, part of it is sort of many different combinations of types of care and care integration, um, and also working with two separate systems that have different policies and procedures and history. And yet, I think intuitively, it makes sense to provide um, substance use treatment and mental health services, especially if that's where the majority of folks are getting their treatment. Um, you know, folks mentioned um, having, you know, navigating two different programs, there's transportation issues, there's appointment issues, scheduling stuff, uh, financial burdens that might come with co-pays. Um, and then, you know, you're working with multiple providers, who knows, you know, sometimes you get conflicting answers and views on different things. Um, and so integrated care can really kind of avoid this traditional fragmentation of care um, and for patients kind of following between the cracks and really kind of treat the whole person um, and meet patients where they are at. So I keep using the term integrated care. What, what exactly does this mean? Um, there's different levels of integration of care. Uh, you know, here we're talking about substance use disorder treatment into mental health services. 
Um, and this uh, chart was made, it was uh, adapted from um, integrated care in terms of primary care and mental health services. But as you can see, there's many different levels of integration, models of care, many different definitions of care integration, which probably makes research a little bit difficult at times. Um, and efforts to integrate care and levels of, you know, which model of care you might use uh, might depend on what your service aims are, what your resources are, what your structure is. So, um, but I do want to point out there's, you know, three sort of big models of integra care integration. Coordinated care where, you know, addiction and mental health professionals are practicing separately. Co-located care where, you know, they're practiced together. Maybe they're located side by side, but there's still some different, you know, policies and procedures uh, and different care teams. Um, and then we talk about integrated care, which really um, consists of integrated care teams that collaboratively um, design and implement unified care plans. And so there's, you know, you can think about maybe where you practice and where in terms of care integration you are at. Well, this sounds great. Uh, why are we not all doing integration of care? And one of the major things is actually stigma. So, you know, for almost a century, we've really kind of viewed addictions, opioid addictions as some sort of moral failing, as some self-inflicted criminal matter. And um, the culture is shifting, but uh, you know, it's been around for a long time, that view. And so we're talking about if you, uh, taking time to uh, reverse or change these, uh, the stigma there. Um, and then interdisciplinary differences is understanding and the philosophy of, uh, philosophy of addiction as the illness and how to approach treatment for them. Um, even MET, you know, the uh, name itself, Medication Assisted Treatment, um, and the way we're stigmatizing uh, treatment for addiction disorder by sort of making these medications somehow different uh, than that say, you know, we don't say insulin is MET for diabetes or anything like that, uh, and yet we're calling these medications under a, a separate category. Um, but it, it is catchy, so I think it's part of why it's been around. Um, and then the idea that uh, these medications that we're using for treatment are in ways substituting um, for street drugs. So we're just substituting one addiction for another is what some people feel. And then that message gets conveyed to patients who then have a lot of ambivalence about pharmacotherapy for, for addiction treatment. Um, insufficient workforce training, or just these days insufficient workforce. Um, but, you know, having the folks who are dedicated to this and training them to um, practice integrated care is another big barrier. And then things like we've mentioned in terms of services that have policies about, you know, who is accepted to this one service or not, wait lists, uh, access to care, and uh, flight hours and other things that can be um, a systemic barrier to patients engaging. All right. So talked about a little bit of history and the sort of barriers to integrated treatment, but let's talk about facilitators that really helped our team, Estron Ties, um, begin to integrate care. Okay. Um, so you might have heard CCBHC or other presentations, which stands for Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic. And I don't know what that is. Hold on. Don't start. You start later. Okay, well, we're making sure the computer doesn't restart. Um, so part of the CCBHC is that um, there are certain core services that need to be offered, which includes outpatient mental health and substance use treatment, um, and allowed us to kind of address some of the regulatory and reimbursement barriers to integration. So a major one is being able to hire embedded uh, CASACs, which stands for Credentialed Alcoholism and Substance Use Counselors. Uh, who work with addictions and provide evaluation and treatment interventions to patients. And as we're integrating these embedded case acts, we start talking more about how do we really integrate, um, how do we really integrate substance use disorder treatment into mental health. Uh, in addition, another facilitator for us was the Office of Mental Health uh, Opioid Use Disorder Initiative. So this initiative was focused on uh, 485 non-addiction mental health clinics in the state of New York, Strong Ties being one of them. Um, and they listed out sort of five organizational best practices for uh, treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, one is screening, two is providing naloxone, which you might know as Narcan. Uh, three is MAT referral, so referral to medication options. Uh, number four is waivered prescribers. So um, 
folks who want to prescribe buprenorphine have to go through an extra training and certification uh, to be able to actually prescribe that. And then number five is offering MAT at the clinics itself, and specifically buprenorphine and Vivitrol or extended release naltrexone. Um, now, I had a chance to communicate with some of the folks at OMH who were kind enough to share some of their data. Um, and really, they've been able to show that this initiative had significantly, uh, statistically significantly improved um, the best practices. Uh, and now, in order to graduate from this um, initiative, you have to meet all five criteria. Um, and uh, currently, about 12% of clinics have met this criteria, um, and Strong Ties being one of them, we graduated this past July in 2020. So um, I think great work, but definitely still more work to be done. So if MAD is such an important part of our substance use disorder treatment, and we're working towards integration of um, substance use disorder treatment into mental health, a big question that came up was, well, how do we provide MAT services to our strong ties patients? Uh, because you could have the resources, the staff, the mandates, but that doesn't necessarily mean that change will be implemented. So this was sort of the beginning formation of our strong ties MAT team. Um, over the last three years, we've been working hard in terms of initially forming a task force focused on integrated treatment, and part of that treatment Task force was reaching out to medication providers to see who'd be interested in, and got a lot, got a lot of interest, and so we eventually developed the Strong Ties MAT team. A series of trainings are rolled out to the clinic overall in terms of Narcan, certain types of practice innovation trainings, um, more about medications and MAT, uh, and presentations from our, co our colleagues at Strong Recovery and Toxicology. I'm not going to go too much into details about all this, as our pre uh, other presenters will talk a little bit about their experience. Um, and then last but not least, I was going to mention that you know we started off with one wavered buprenorphine prescriber uh, three years ago, and now or two years, four years ago, two three years ago. Now we have seven, so we've really been sort of focusing on being able to offer um, these services for our clients. So once the ball started rolling, things kind of fell into place. Um, not to say that we didn't have our bumps in the road, but uh, we had a sort of a clear uh, vision and mission to um, aim for. And now our Strong Ties MAT team includes um, a combination of physicians and nurse practitioners, along with our nursing team, our embedded chemical dependency counselors. Um, sometimes we have guests from our colleagues over at Strong Recovery, and really kind of open up to anyone who wants to join in or drop in, uh, whether they have cases or they just want to learn. Um, services that we really focus on, again, is the, um, big, op the big three for, uh, big two for opioid use disorder, in terms of buprenorphine and naltrexone vivitrol, um, along with NARC. And, and also providing toxicology screens um, and consultations to other strong ties providers as um, uh, engagement in this MAT team is not a requirement for, for all providers of strong ties. So. We have monthly meetings, we have spreadsheets, uh, we have a whole intake process from beginning to end, um, and then we do uh, have uh, folks who are uh, co-enrolled in strong recovery, so having sort of close triage team meetings and collaborative meetings regarding that. Um, I do want to, uh, before I move on, I do want to emphasize the support part. So, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. A few years ago, before the pandemic, I remember um, being at a meeting and talking about, like, rolling out Suboxone to the clinic. This was before the yeah, before pandemic. Every, we were all, you know, stuffed into one, one meeting room. Um, and I was talking about Suboxone, and multiple concerns came up from staff, right? And I was thinking to myself, what the heck did I get myself into? Um, and now, fast forward a couple years, I have folks volunteer to be up here to, with me to talk about this. And so really, I believe that uh, team being together for each other, supporting each other, um, championing new initiatives, working out through the conflicts, and celebrating wins um, was really key to all of this. So I will now turn it over to John. Took your work like just to the right? Yeah. Awesome. All right, thank you so much. My name is John Handel. I'm the embedded uh, senior CDC over at Strong Ties. I've also transitioned over to being a primary therapist um, working with co-occurring disorders. I just wanted to highlight a couple things uh, in regards to how um, mental health settings and addiction treatment settings traditionally uh, approach um, substance use disorders and the mental health uh, therapy. 
Just gonna highlight a couple of them. If you look at the motivation to stop using drugs, generally it's gonna be lower in the psychiatric settings and uh, as opposed to the addiction treatment settings, it's gonna be relatively higher. The care team uh, is primarily consisted in the mental health uh, system settings of a psychiatrist, whereas in the addiction treatment, uh, it's generally not, right? <clears throat> In the mental health treatment setting, most or all patients are on medications, where in the substance use disorders, now I'm just speaking traditionally, uh, in the substance use disorder treatment centers, it's generally um, few are on medications. Uh, the outreach and case management, um, it's usually funded within the mental health treatment settings, whereas in the substance use disorders, it's usually not. Now I'm talking traditionally, and I'm not talking about how we have become this CCVHC, most of those services now are, as uh, Dr. Fu highlighted, integrated. And that's an important thing to talk about because we have to meet our clients where they are, we have to learn to roll with that resistance, and we have to constantly be encouraging community connections. As the embedded uh, senior CDC, that has been my role, has uh, been keeping uh, our members, keeping our patients connected to the community even though at a lot of times their mental health disorders or their substance use disorders are limiting that. So keeping it short. So recovery also does not occur in a vacuum. Uh, the uh, importance of teamwork cannot be understated, but we also have to learn to overcome our own internal biases. We have been trained as a KSAC or as a substance use professional that we want to encourage our clients to be abstinent. That mentality uh, permeates all aspects of recovery, where they're gonna be encouraging them in peer support groups, you know, to try, stop taking their medications. We have to learn to roll with that and encourage them, yes, a lot of people that you're seeing in peer support groups, AA, NA, Recovery Fitness, have achieved abstinence or recovery and are not taking medications. A lot of times that's not gonna to apply to our clients within our population because they are living with a severe persistent mental illness. So not taking medications, that's just not gonna work. <clears throat> with that being said, we do wanna always encourage that AA, NA, creative wellness, recovery fitness, learning about those recovery options in their community, encouraging them to go, reaching out to the care managers. Care management is essential because they're gonna be the ones that are out in the community, able to make contact with a client, when they're feeling at their lowest. Just like Dr. Fu highlighted, addressing mental health and substance use disorders at the exact same time is the key. Not saying, you know, you're gonna see me today, I need you to see your therapist on, uh, for substance use disorder on Wednesday or Friday. Being able to have that conversation with them, their primary therapist over at Strong Recovery, Huth or Doyle, wherever they're getting their chemical dependency treatment or their mental health therapy. Finally, I just wanna add, uh, using our community as a method of treatment to teach community as a method of recovery. That's gonna be the biggest key. And I think that that's one of the things I really enjoyed being part of the uh, medication assisted therapy team is that we will have those difficult conversations. We will bring it back to the patient and we'll see where they wanna go. That's all I got. Turn it over to Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole, I'm the MAT nurse on the team. Um, so I have a few different duties and responsibilities, um, but we'll start from the beginning. So when a patient first starts treatment with us for MAT services, um, I can either sit in on an appointment with the provider or meet with the patient uh, individually one-on-one. -on -one. And at that time I will go over contracts, um, expectations, um, I'll do a breathalyzer on them, I'll do a quick Narcan training and provide them with a kit. Um, and then I will also make sure, during the same time, make sure that their medications, if brand new, will go through their insurance company so there's no gaps in care. And if they're brand new to Suboxone or Vivitrol, we'll do a, like a small dose to, to challenge, to make sure that they would process it okay, won't have any side effects, and can go ahead and take it either in the community or continue to get it administered by us at the clinic. Um, while they're in treatment, I do also random recalls, we call it, but it's Basically, I pick up the phone, call them, say you have 48 hours to come in, bring in your Suboxone strips, and we'll need to do a tax screen, and then that kind of checks and balances everything, make sure that patient is doing what they're supposed to do, we're doing what we're supposed to do, we know that the medication is being taken by the patient, and that they're on track in treatment. 
Um, also with Vivitrol, there are quite a few of liver side effects, so I have to make sure that the patients are getting their labs drawn they need to be, make sure that there's orders in the computer for that, and work pretty collaboratively with the rest of the team. And then also during all of this, building rapport with the patient. Uh, I also update the spreadsheet before and during our monthly meetings, and I have a quick screenshot of what it looks like. Um, so we keep track of the doses and how long the durations of each script are to make sure that if um, a patient is due for a refill and also if someone, say they tested positive for something, we would then bring back their strip count or their days of supply, um, keep track of when we last did a talk screen. So when we pull up the spreadsheet at the monthly meeting, we can look and say, oh, patient A hasn't been screened in whatever, X amount of days, but we need to call them, have them come in. And it's a very clear picture of what's going on so we can keep tabs on all of our folks. Um, and then, as you can see, we also keep track of their therapists, if they have a KSAC, um, and when we did contracts and things like that with them. And now I will turn it over to Heather Muxworthy, one of our providers. So I'm Heather Muxworthy. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, I've been around Strong Ties for many, many years. I was very fortunate to be introduced to Strong Ties back in 1990, shortly after it opened, um, for my master's in clinical nurse specialist. There weren't psych NPs back then. Um, and my placement was at Strong Ties. And very quickly, I learned that it was really the place that I wanted to be. And I have a lot of passion for these um, serious and persistent mentally ill patients that we work with. I've come and gone about four times from Strong Ties through the years, but part of what brings me back is my passion for the patients, but also the fact that I love the team approach. Um, these patients are very, very challenging at times, and it's just comforting, I guess, to know that you're not all alone with the, the patient care. There's always someone around and available to consult with you about uh, problem solving an issue, um, and now that we've advanced into uh, integrating substance abuse treatment, it, it really, that team approach is more important than anything. So Annabelle was being very gracious before when she said that staff were a little resistant at first, but <laughs> opened up with support. I actually was the, one of the staff members, well, I, I was the staff member, that actually had a meltdown when she came to a staff meeting and suggested that we were going to start integrating Suboxone at Strong Ties. Um, it felt very overwhelming. It felt like a daunting task. I, it felt like there's the potential for the floodgates to open. And then after I took some time and thought about it, and I spoke with our director, and our director was like, you know, this is an OMH initiative, and we're going to do this, but we're, it's by no means a floodgates. We're going to take one patient at a time. Each patient will be dealt with it, with an individual plan. So I decided to do the training, and um, the training itself was a bit overwhelming, but Annabelle was really helpful in terms of just providing support and reassuring us as we did the training and answered the questions and brought outside people in to talk with us about toxicology and how to read the random counts and um, all kinds of things. So. You know, I ended up deciding to take this on as a challenge, and the other thing that really was important to remember was that it also was on, um, or at a time when mental health was starting to be pushed into primary care. And so what I realized, and having been in the system for so many years, you know, the silos no longer exist, the days of, you know, mental health and developmentally disability, you know, that's blended now. Um, and so it made sense to have chemical dependency, substance abuse treatment, meld with um, the mental health treatment. And we had so many patients at Strong Ties that are, are co-addicted, it just made sense. So in terms of the provider role, the very first thing is obviously establishing relationship. It's kind of, you know, mental health 101. Um, you're not going to get anywhere in treating these patients if you have no trust with them. Uh, it really has to be about that good uh, rapport between the two of you. You know, in the DBT world, we call it radical genuineness. You have to have that uh, trusting, honest, open relationship at the same time be able to set the limits and reinforce the expectations when the patient isn't following the contract. So it can get 
tricky, no doubt about it. One of the things that I do initially with the patients is do a lot of education up front. I have in the front of my desk, I hang things off the front of my desk, and it's like the pictures of you know, the body and how uh, cannabis affects the body, how alcohol affects the body. Um, sometimes I'll hang up there an evidence-based practice um, article that you know, is an overview of the approach of cannabis and psychosis. Um, I do a lot of looking things up on up-to-date and teaching patients right there in the session around why we don't want them using these drugs. It's been interesting since the legalization of marijuana. Um, I'm, you know, I'm doing a lot of trying to re-educate people around the mixed data that is out there. You know, I explain to people, I'm like, I'm a nurse, I'm a nurse practitioner, I'm never gonna be happy with something that is toxic that you're gonna expose your lungs to, regardless of how it gets there, or worse, something that you're injecting into your blood system. So I'm always gonna err on the side of teaching the health education, not join with you around uh, a dysfunctional behavior that I know is gonna to be toxic to you in the end. So, you know, a lot of it up front and really throughout is really teaching. Um, one of the things that I do a lot of teaching on is cannabis withdrawal syndrome. There's a lot of people that have never even heard that there's a cannabis withdrawal syndrome. So that's another thing I have hanging there. So um, it's always that reinforce, reinforce. Every patient is individual. Um, we actually have, um, you know, a MAP meeting once a month. We have triage meeting once a month that happens between strong ties and strong recovery. Um, I'm going to present a couple of cases at the end that really kind of shows the integration of those two systems and how we work together. You know, part of it is trying to determine where that patient's coming from. When I realized in the beginning, somebody said it earlier, most of these patients aren't ready. A lot of them are pre-contemplation. So your approach is gonna be a lot of motivational interviewing, a lot of education, just really trying to move them to a position where they're able to make some kind of commitment. And if they can't, then you take the harm reduction approach. Um, but, you know, determining what the barriers are. Lots of times for our folks, the barrier is transportation. Um, I don't know where you all work, but trying to get patients to a clinic um, with these various cab companies is um, very challenging at times, especially in the winter when they show up late. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that in itself is just something to take into consideration. Um, lots of times patients are kind of being nudged and forced into treatment by family members, but they're not necessarily ready. So there has to be some intervention in terms of families, spouses, you know, whoever is involved in their care. Certainly monitoring and um, the consequences, I, I rely a lot on nursing for that. Nursing is really um, our backup in terms of really, Nicole is so good at monitoring the liver enzymes how long it's been since somebody's been called in for a random count. Um, lots of times they see the labs before we see the labs. So it, it's a very close, and we're right there together. We're all kind of in the same hallway, which kind of helps. Um, so if there's anything that comes up, then usually at Strong Ties, the phone calls come in first and go straight to nursing. And then so nursing's their first layer of communication, and then it comes to us next. Um, in terms of continuum or continuum of care, case discussions and transitions to the different levels, this is where it gets a little tricky, um, and you'll see this in the cases that are presented. But you know, there's there's patients at strong ties. We are primarily mental health, and we're starting to merge in substance abuse treatment, strong recovery, primarily substance abuse treatment. Lots of different offerings in terms of individual care, group care. They've got peer services, case management, the whole realm of services over there. Sometimes patients will be heavier on the mental health side than on the strong or the substance abuse side or vice versa. So trying to figure out, does the person go there? Do they stay with us? Do we do some kind of a merge? Um, most times we try to do some kind of a merge. But there's been a couple of cases that we've dealt with since the beginning that we've had to go the extra mile and get everybody together on um, well, in COVID world, a Zoom meeting to try to talk through what are the pros and cons of doing some kind of integrated care. 
Okay, so thank you, Heather, Nicole, and John. Um, as you can see, we started off with identifying a clinical need in our clinic. Um, and we've been busy the last couple of years addressing this through organizational um, changes. Uh, but we're really still earlier, early on in our process. And so we're at the point of kind of reflecting on what's our next steps, um, such as sort of redefining our role. You know, are we really kind of just focused on that or are we talking about more of a clinic-wide integration of care? Um, and then, you know, we talked about a little bit about what, what is the spectrum of care that we can offer uh, in terms of the roles of our embedded KSAC or CD counselors, and then at what point, um, as Heather mentioned a little bit, like where do folks go in terms of systems and levels of care? Um, evaluating, you know, are we reaching all the patients who would benefit from that as strong ties? Um, in, is what we're doing working? And then talking about expanding, are we doing enough collaboration with therapists? Uh, how about uh, ongoing trainings and education? And so those are some of the things that we are um, right now kind of pondering in terms of our, our next steps, so. And last but not least, just want to um, recognize the integral members of our team who uh, were not, uh, unable to come up here with us, uh, along with our other strong test clinicians and leadership. So feel free to reach out to us, reach out to us by email anytime. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay. From the audience at all? Yes, so. Hi, Dr. Fu. Whoa, that's a lot of noise. A couple quick questions. So, um, I actually think I might, John? John? I'm, I'm a fellow KSAC, so I might direct my first question to you. Um, I saw for the first case that um, Heather presented that there was a concern with the patient when he was at strong recovery because he wasn't doing well in the group setting. Um, and I guess I'm just curious from, are, are there groups that are offered for this population over at Strong Ties? I can imagine having somebody with severe persistent mental illness, schizoaffective disorder, you know, it, difficult potentially integrating into a group setting, especially over at Strong Recovery. Ha, have there been, is there work on this? Is, are there groups available? Are, are there different dynamics if there are groups available compared to what we think as traditional CD groups, just some thoughts, questions about that. Yeah, no problem. We have a MICA group that we were, I don't need it. Okay. <laughs> Do I need it? Uh, oh, Zoom needs it. Zoom needs it, sorry. Uh, so I have a, I run a MICA group, uh, and it's the old term for mental illness and chemical uh, addiction. But um, I run that every Friday from one to two. It's a fantastic group of individuals. Um, and it's, a, it's beautiful. I've been running it now for the past three years. Um, so are you, are you wanting to submit a referral? Is that what? I mean, I probably could, but. Uh, awesome. They just got to be connected to Strong Ties, that's all. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Um, actually, I'm not practicing KSEC. I do other stuff, but. Um, okay. Always the KSEC. Um, my other question more broadly, and this is my last one, I promise, um, is I guess I'm curious about the data being gathered around this, both maybe from like a, a satisfaction perspective, a reduction in overdose, uh, you know, what, what data since this process has been in place has been gathered? How often are you collecting it? Are you using it to look for even like your, kind of your next level of improvement? Just always curious about the data. I love your uh, data-focused mind, Helen. Um, <laughs> so I think that's, that, that is the next discussion for us. I think we've been focused on sort of building this team. Um, and now uh, we feel ready to sort of collect some of those data. And I'm sure there's lots of um, services or uh, uh, committees or teams in our, in our department who can help us with that. So, love to talk to you more. <laughs> I just want to uh, mention Dr. King made a few comments. Um, and one of the questions that he was asking is, uh, full integration will require basing the patients in MIPS as the hub and following them as they need via strong ties or strong recovery. Is this in the, off in the offering for our services? Um, that sounds like probably a more department-wide discussion, uh, but I, you know, as we talked about, sort of this cares of integration, um, really, as Heather mentioned, it's not just you know substance use into mental health, but also mental health in primary care and other um, different models of care. So, uh, definitely, would love to talk more about how to um, even become more integrated. I don't know if um, our panelists have anything to add to that. 
I think before we even go there, part of what we have to do, we know that there's a, a large population of people out there that we're not even reaching. So I think that, you know, part of within strong ties anyways, we really need to find out um, how we can get to those patients and how we can motivate those patients that we know are out there that are struggling to find a way to get them into some kind of level of treatment. Um, and probably the same is the case on the strong recovery side. I'm sure they have people that are struggling with the mental health that they're feeling not able to reach either. So I think that it's a matter of just really continuing to um, develop our services. And then um, I was thinking earlier, I'm like, you know what, we, we should be writing up one of these cases um, for publication because I think that if we save one person, we're doing our job. Um, and just those two gentlemen that we um, presented, I mean, both of them, I think are gonna, they're gonna do well. And at some point they may relapse, but the, the point is, is we're gonna be there to help them get through that. So, and, and actually both of those gentlemen, I have a really good relationship with, and I have no doubts that if they relapse, they will be very honest about it. They'll just come straight forward and let us know that it's, it's happening. So, but I do think that, you know, the, the first case, there were many, many, many hospital days that um, he's no longer having. So that idea of, of really kind of taking a look at who we already have and what have we done in terms of outcomes is very important. So. And we have another question from Dr. Mathis who, oh, uh, actually. Yeah, go ahead. I see your services are mainly for adults, and I'm wondering if you do provide any services for adolescents or youth, like someone who's 16 years old, and for those who may refuse to accept services, what, off, what would you do with that? What are the options that parents may have to get help to deal with their child who is dependent on drugs? And how can we help that child get into recovery? That's a great question. Um, I think, and Annabelle, you may know more, I believe that the age of strong recovery is... I think 14 years old. 14 to through adulthood. And I believe strong ties is 16 now up. But I thought with the OMH initiative, they lowered it. You're right, so 19 to 26 for your strong ties, young adults. Um, probably younger than that, it would be in that child and adolescent sector, so. Um, no, that's a good point because I think, um, you know, although we have addiction services for, for youth and adolescents, um, that is still in a separate sort of clinic, right? So we're talking about maybe, you know, the idea of integrating substance use disorder into our mental health clinic, can that be something that's replicated to other mental health clinics, including those in the, in the primary care and in the adolescent world, so. I've had some experience with the NAMI family to family program, and I know that they do cover um, the substance abuse in there. I mean, it's brief because it's a 12 week program, but um, that is a really good program for family members, especially, and it, it's the patient and the family member that attend those classes together. So that's certainly a resource that I've given a lot of people. Can you uh, tell me what NAMI means? That's the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. Um, and here in Rochester, yeah, we're, we're, we're very lucky in Rochester. Our chapter is one of the more active chapters throughout the state. So uh, their uh, offices are in uh, Village Gate. So it's a wonderful resource for families. There's a question up there. Thank you. Do you have a process um, that you use to decide 
what patients should get this integrated support versus who should get the separate treatment and strong recovery and strong ties. Um, I know you have like the meetings that you discuss the cases, but I was wondering if like you have like an algorithm or something you use to decide who you take. All right, so like I said, I started as a senior chemical dependency embedded provider um, working over in the uh, young adult clinic. And it would just simply work with an intake being performed by the primary therapist, the primary therapist and the patient uh, collaborate and say, hey, there's a substance use disorder in there. We want to ferret that out a little bit more, so we're going to send you over to the embedded. I was, when I was working as the embedded, I would do a chemical dependency evaluation, identify any barriers to treatment, and then move forward with a treatment plan with that patient. As a primary therapist now, it's the exact same way. So that's how it works. And we, um, because we are a CCBHC, we do triage, which I think you heard Heather talk about. And that's where all of the providers that are referring a patient from both strong recovery and strong ties meet and discuss patients and say, we think they need a higher level of care for their chemical dependency. We're gonna send them over to strong recovery for increased groups, more uh, community-based therapy, things like that. Same goes for strong recovery. They say patient needs more mental health, and that's how it works. It's, it's pretty awesome, not gonna lie. I was just gonna add in, um, the MAT services um, is more of a referral, like if they're an identified in team by therapists that would benefit from at least a discussion with one of our MAT providers, then we would initiate that. Um, but I think it is a very fluid process. There's no like hard line as to like, hey, you're in this track or you're in this track or we're going to refer you to somewhere else. Um, and I think uh, one of those cases, you know, as you can see, there was multiple different levels of care being um, utilized. And so um, a lot of our discussion is on, you know, where is this person getting treatment? What level of care? What kind of integration is there? Um, and it is a good point that John's making that, um, you know, we're not here to form a, a whole addictions clinic within Strong Ties. Um, the embedded counselor, uh, chemical dependency counselor role is slightly different than, um, and then only, you know, one or two of them. So there's slightly different uh, approach to sort of addictions treatment. So um, I do want to point out Dr. Mathis was asking, in getting started, what trainings and topics did you feel were priorities for staff education to address concerns or reluctance? Um, I'll let the panelists also chime in. I'll just say that uh, no one, no one single um, training or topic really kind of comes to mind. I think it's really actually the um, more one-on-one, small teams, education that really gets people to fully understand what we're trying to aim for, um, rather than sort of these large discussions or presentations. So if others want to chime in on that? I know in the beginning you did kind of an overview of it for the staff and then as we got started we realized that we needed more training in terms of how to read the buprenorphine levels in tox screens um, and so we had a couple of sessions where we met with uh, drug scan we, which does the oral testing uh, and then we've had uh, um, oh my goodness I'm gonna blank on his name that wonderful toxicologist from oh Dr. Fung yes uh, who came in, uh, talked with us, or videoed in, I don't remember what it was, about, you know, what some false positives that could come up. So, you know, really, whenever we've kind of stumbled on something that we're not so sure of, that's when, you know, we start thinking about, okay, we got to bring somebody in to give us some more uh, help on the situation. And we've got our partners next door. I, I know I've reached over to, like when we were talking about the one particular patient going on sublocade, I called Strong Recovery and I said, talk me through how we get somebody on sublocade. And literally 10 minutes later, there's Tanya at the door giving me a whole stack of information of sublocade and how you go through it and how they, you get the prior off and all of those things. So, you know, I mean, I think being right next door to each other is what has really been the most helpful out of anything. So it's what certainly helped my confidence. And Dr. Fu is always available and responds very quickly, so that, that helps as well. I think we're going to end there because, you know, that was a compliment to me. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I know it's 1 o'clock, so if any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Right.